Welcome to a new episode of Next Stop Everywhere, your podcast all about the doctor, his companions, and lately, Missy. (laughs) Uh, I am Jesse Jackson, and joining me after his world travels (laughs) is my friend in Hoonis, Charles Skaggs. Hi, Jesse. How are you today? I am great. I am Uh, exhausted. (laughs) Yes. Um... Uh, so Charles, tell us what's made you so tired. <laughs> well, let's see. After a week of going out to Salt Lake and going out with uh, all of my like five thousand nieces and nephews to uh, like the Salt Lake Aquarium and the zoo, and then three straight days of Salt Lake Comic Con. Um, you know, I, I, and coming home, jet lagged, going to work the next day, doing a podcast with my, our partner, regular partner in crime, Karen Lindsay, and then going to work today and then coming home and doing another podcast with you. So, uh, if I collapse mid podcast, I apologize. That's on me. But- well, and, and if, if they remember, yeah, uh, when we recorded uh, the podcast for the season premiere, yes, uh, it was after the episode in real time. We talked, uh, you know, a fair amount, and then you had a like a seven a.m. flight. Yes, yeah. So, yeah. so, <laughs> so I'm not so, a. I am still being, alive. Yeah, not being at the airport at seven, a flight at yeah. seven a.m. Um, so, anything cool happen at the convention? Uh, went to the Jenna Coleman panel. Oh, nice. And, uh, she was absolutely lovely. Yeah. Uh, she was very personable. Uh, the panel, she was, I mean, very quick witted. Jenna is, and especially with the fan questions. Some of them, of course, she's heard millions of times before. Others were pretty recent because of the Magician's Apprentice right. airing, uh, the previous Saturday, but, uh, she was on top of her game. She handled it very well. Um, one young fan, uh, asked her, uh, what kind of superhero she would like to be. Mm -hmm. And to which she replied, uh, I'm already a superhero. I'm Clara Oswald. I'm a school teacher that travels in time and saves the world. How great is that? Nice. I thought was a very great response. That is a great response. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So good. uh, So she was very charming. Got her autograph. uh, Yay. Line. Uh, she yes, she is as gorgeous in person as she is on TV. I can imagine was the line uh, out the building. It wasn't out the building, but it was a good sized line. I mean, yeah. she, she was giving Haley Atwell a run for her money. Let me say. Wow. So yeah. Good. Uh, how long do you have to wait? I'm just uh, curious. Let's see. It probably well. Thankfully, my wife Lori kind of jumped in line while I was at another panel. Yeah. Uh, so she kind of s- saved me probably be out 15 minutes of time. I'd say total wait uh, somewhere around an hour. That's not bad. No, it's not bad. I mean, you got to accept it for it, someone that well, she, she didn't really like. She talked with everybody, but yeah, she was professional enough. Um, apart from showing up 15 minutes late, but you know, yeah. but she showed up and, uh, but she just moved in line right along. She didn't try to rush anybody, but yet, you know, everybody just kind of like, okay, um, move on to the next person. And yeah. Um, I was a little sad when Karen Gillian was here. Um, I had, um, a sketch someone had done as the girl who waited, you know, with the young, right. You know, Amy Pond waiting and, um, they were so backed up and yeah. so busy that she didn't even look up. She really? signed her name and moved. And yeah. and I kind of – the only reason I wasn't a little bitter yeah. is I was in line waiting for like 30, 40 minutes, and she hadn't even shown up yet because – you know, you the line starts while she's still doing pictures, or right. you know, and I said, you know, um, I don't get her autograph. I don't get her autograph. So I went down and 
I think I went to a fringe panel. I went to another panel Mm -hmm. and it was a good panel and I had a lot of fun and, you know, rule number one of conventions, not the doctor lies, but rule number one of conventions is enjoy what you're doing. Don't focus on what you're not doing uh, because you'll be miserable the whole convention. So I went to the panel, had a great time and came back and the guy that I had talked to was still in line (laughs) <laughs> I'm like, hey, how you doing? Good. Didn't move. And, and he did not offer to let me go back to my place in line, which rightly so. Mm-hmm. But um, there was a guy taking money for signatures, and he said, um, we are going to get to everyone if you want to. So I paid my money, and then and they were trying to get it out before she left for the airport. So I was like, okay, you know, I, I've had my share where um, I've got to talk to a few people yeah. and connect. like. The story I told about, you know, Stephen Amell, yeah. even if they were moving it, we had our little moment. So it sounds like you did the same. Yeah, although, um, you know, I'd, I'd say probably I got a little bit more of that from that from um, from Jenna. Yeah, I say at least a little bit more. Um, John Barrowman was a little bit rushed, but, um, cause I got his autograph as well. Didn't get to attend one of his panels, sadly. Yeah. Um, really wanted to go, but, yeah. um, but he was talking to one of his, like, I guess his handler or something. And he was mm-hmm. talking about how he really needed to go to the loo or yeah. his, his words. Yeah. So maybe he was feeling a little rushed because he needed to go to the bathroom. So, yeah. Uh, when he was at comic, so I kind of get that. Yeah, he was in Comic Palooza a couple of years ago, mm-hmm. and l- I waited till like Sunday mm-hmm. or Monday. I can't remember which, but it was it was the second half of the convention, and there was only three or four people behind me. And he, you know, I told the, I told a story about uh, I kind of blushed and kind of fanboyed that I think he is an important. Um, Role model is a bad word, but he is an important symbol, right. I think, for, um, you know, an alternate lifestyle. And yeah. people, I'm going to get the initials wrong, so I won't even try. <laughs> and and he appreciated that. And we told a couple of stories and we talked for a little bit. So that was kind of nice. Okay. Um, anybody else you saw? Or? Well, actually, I went to the... Um... I went to the 10 years of new who panel. Ooh, nice. Uh, hope I, I was hoping it was going to be nice, but sadly it just turned out to be a, an hour long bitch session. Essentially. It was basically the, the panel could be boiled down into this, um, uh, Rose and tenant forever. Uh, a, uh, Matt Smith sucks. Rory sucks. Amy sucks. Clara really sucks. And uh, we hate Stephen Moffat. That was the panel, basically. Did um... so it was very frustrating. And I'm sitting there in the audience, and it just, as a as a fan of Doctor Who from the beginning to now, yeah. uh, it, it was very frustrating because these people they they acted like they were fans, but really it was just they liked their favorite doctors, and that was pretty much it. Everything else is kind of like it didn't meet up to that standard. And and I don't know about you. I'm not going to speak for you. And there were six people there on that panel, and yeah. all of, pretty much all of them were jaded. So, like very- I said, I'm not going to speak for you. I'm going to just speak for me. Mm-hmm. And and I'm going to admit this is egotistical. Right. But um, been doing podcasts for a couple of years. Yes. I've hosted a couple of panels. Yes. I in my day job, I've you know, hosted panels and been presenters. And I get really upset Mm -hmm. when someone is doing a poor panel. Right. You know, there is a reason why there's a moderator. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why you keep things moving. You keep changing. You, you, you look for someone with a different opinion, you know, and, and you make it an interesting discussion. Mm -hmm. And I at times go, I would do so much better than the people who are doing this. Right. And 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 I, I'm sorry if that sounds egotistical, but <laughs> you know, if you're gonna spend ten years of who, yeah. And, and, okay, I'm gonna give you a quick story. Okay. Um. And and dear listener, we are gonna get to the new episode. Yeah, we are gonna talk about the witches <laughs> because the yeah, because it was a great episode. But just yeah. catching up. Um. I went on a job interview Friday afternoon. Good for you. And went pretty well. And 
um, I was telling a story about, you know, I like to be silly and I like to have fun and I may wear, you know, I, you know, I have a, I, you know, I, I have a Superman piggy bank on my desk and I have, you know, a board cube. And I, I said, and, you know, and on Jersey day, when everyone else is in a Cowboys or Green Bay Jersey, I may wear my TARDIS Jersey. How do you make a TARDIS Jersey? The guy interviewing. <laughs> I said, I think I have a photo and I showed him, he goes, yep. That's a TARDIS jersey. That's perfect. And so as we're walking out the interview, it took about an hour and a half. And um, <clears throat> he said something about um, you you didn't you didn't pass the test, you know, or you've got bonus points for asking this or something. And I said, well, you get bonus points for knowing what a TARDIS was. <laughs> he goes, oh, yeah, I'm a I'm a big geek. He says, I absolutely know what a TARDIS is. I said, oh, well, so it happens. You know, I do a t Doctor Who podcast. He goes, oh, so who would be your doctor then? Who's your favorite doctor? <laughs> and no, he said, who's the most important doctor is how he asked it. Oh, that's an interesting way to phrase and it. And I said, well, I, I said, if you're asking my favorite doctor, I would say David Tennant. Mm -hmm. Though I loved Matt Smith and I really like what Peter Capaldi's doing. But if you ask me who's the most important doctor... I would either say, you know, uh, Patrick Trotton, because mm -hmm. he had to sell the idea that it's the same guy, or Christopher Eccleston, who brought back, you know, he had all that weight right. of, we're starting this back. And he goes, yeah, I could see that. Um, I said, how about you? He says, oh, I'd probably go with Tennant. Tennant is my favorite doctor. And so, so the point of the story is, if I'm doing 10 years of Who, I'm going to bring up Eccleston. Yeah. You know, that is easy for you to forget him. He only did one season. Mm -hmm. They were finding their um, footing. But as you and I have gone through mm -hmm. our, our journey through past two, we've really, I think, tried to listen and tried to share with our fans, listeners, that, you know. <laughs> I hope they're fans. I hope they're fans. That there is some beauty to all these different doctors and all of them have a different shade. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um I love them all. I love all the doctors, um, some more than others, granted, but um, I still find something of value in each of them. Yeah. And I think that they're, they're all important in their own way right? Uh, for their, whatever their respective time was or, you know, their respective companions, w stories, what have you. But uh, so, yeah. So, yeah, it gets a little frustrating when I just I, I see like this, the the. If there was, it's the stereotypical new fan. Yes. And and they did have a moderator at this panel, but the first question right out of the box, which just blew my mind, is okay, what what is, what don't you like about modern Who right now? So right off the bat, it's a negative question. And you're That's setting a the horrible way to start. It yeah. is a horrible way to start. And so I'm just beating my head, going, Pfft. you know, in, if only, in, I was going, if only Jesse was here. But well, and and I we just could rescue don't, this panel. We could take it over. Convention organizers, mm -hmm. you want a an excellent who panel? Charles and I are your guys. Exactly. Yeah, we, and we'll throw Karen in there. But we're, um, we're who for yeah. hire? <laughs> yes. Well, because I have seen um, I have seen a panel, you know, called criticizing the Stephen Moffat era. Yeah. Okay. You know what you're getting into. Right. This is an episode they are going to talk about or defending the Stephen Moffat era, you know, yeah. would be is how I would pose it. Let's mm -hmm. go through what's, you know, let's yeah. let's acknowledge what we're doing and everything. Um, <laughs> this is what's funny is uh, I'm doing another podcast tonight yeah. with Karen, our Castle podcast. Right. And last night's episode of Castle was so bad. Oh. For the first time, I don't feel like podcasting about it. <gasps> that says a lot. And and I and I've always said that if I get to a show where I don't like it that much, I will probably quit watching it. But I definitely wouldn't podcast about it. Oh wow! You know, and so uh, I'm sure I'll get over it. But um, well, hopefully we can brighten the mood. Absolutely, and, and kind of get lift you up enough to get through that podcast. Absolutely. Um, so thank you, Charles. Thank you okay. for sharing. Sorry. And, and no, listeners. yeah, sorry for going on. Thank so for us about getting that. off on a, a tangent, but um, I, I, I feel you and I've been there at so many times. Well, we talked about there was a classic who how to enjoy classic who panel at Comic Palooza and they just 
their their heart was in the right place. They just weren't good moderators. They didn't have suggestions. They didn't have episodes. They didn't do. And I, you know, and so I tried to help them by talking too much or, you know. Or, <laughs> um, so, so the witch is familiar. Yes. Um, quick thoughts. I was very happy. Um, you and I. Um, not only you and I, but like the Two Minute Time Lord and and some other people that I follow and Whovian were okay. It's a good first half, but are they going to stick the landing? And do you and feel I, they do you feel they stick stuck the landing? I think they did. Okay. I think they did. I I was happy with it. I I, um, I like the little twist. Um, good resolution to the cliffhanger. Yes, I think that was good, and I and it was a. A clever way Mm -hmm. to do it that, you know, they just, you know, the way Missy tells the story, you explain how they got out of it, but also I think sets up this really nice dynamic. And I want to talk about that. Um, Missy and Clara together were just great. Don't you want, don't you want them to have their own spinoff show? Yes, I do. (laughs) And, and, and just... (laughs) But I would feel bad for Clara because she'd be constantly oh. treated like crap throughout all of yes. it. Yes. Um, you know, it is just... She's just going along with whatever Missy cooks up. Yes. And it's, and it's nothing good for Clara, ever. Maybe we should drop the stone. Good idea. Dump. Yep. <laughs> 20 shove, feet. shove her down a pit. Yep. Yes. Oh, it's only 20 feet. Okay. So how about you? Do you think they stuck the landing? Uh, I think for the most part. I don't okay. think it was perfect. Yes. Um, there was some... There was a... You know, like... Some things were a little, I don't know, I want to say convoluted, but um, I don't think it was as, there was, there certainly wasn't as much of an impact as I was hoping. It wasn't just, it wasn't anything that bl- completely blew me away, but it was very strong. Uh, and it, and it, it was a great, uh, strong way to start the season. So, so happy about you, that. you said last episode that there was a possibility that this could be the first true classic right. of the Capaldi era with the a little bit weaker second uh episode my words not yours yeah do you think it missed that mark no i don't i think okay. i think it is i think it's going to be one that over time fans are really going to appreciate um because just because of uh you've got michelle gomez's gomez's incredible performance in yes. this one, uh, you've got the return of Julian Bleach as Davros really doing an excellent job. Yes. Especially his scenes with Capaldi. Yes. Um, that's terrific. Um, the the dynamic with Missy and Clara. Uh, it, there's just so much to like about this episode. There's, there's great moral uh, and ethical dilemmas here, uh, which always makes for great who. So I think it's going to age very well. And we got um, some insight. I'm being inside a Dalek. Yeah. Which I thought was very interesting. And not the first time we've been inside a Dalek. Not and not including the episode inside the Dalek. Yeah, but I meant the um Or enter the Dalek, excuse yeah, me. Yeah, explaining why you know the how they move and, and the, yeah. um, the Mechani- language. The mechanics and Yeah, and then the you know, how things go. The program. Um, yeah. Yeah, and you know, the say I love you. Yeah. You know. Um, so, but n- not to the level of like the empty child and the doctor dances. Um, I wouldn't say the level of empty child or doctor dances or like girl in the fireplace or, or doctor's wife. I wouldn't say it was that high. Well, and, be, and the reason I brought that up is in our discussion with Nicola, Yeah, you know, you said you believe this, the empty child and the doctor dances was the first Modern um, classic. Modern classic that, you know, will stand the test of time forever. Yeah, I think so. So, so that's a pretty, I mean, that's... That's the bar. That's that's a gold standard. Yeah, so that's, that's not getting up to that is okay. Yeah, but it was pretty in the, it was in the ballpark. Okay, good. So I, I don't, I think it was, yeah, I certainly, certainly think it was definitely up there, but it just didn't quite get there. Okay, um, so... There's, there's room for more. There's room to get better. And hopefully we do get better. Yes, I agree. And uh, so, um, do you want to take us through the episode? Yeah, we can go through that okay. if you want, if you'd like. Yeah, that's uh, fine. Okay. Um, okay. So we're we basically this is uh, the which is familiar, obviously, uh, written by Stephen Moffat again, directed by Hetty McDonald again. 
uh, guest starring Michelle Gomez as Missy and Julian Bleach as Davros, uh, yeah. um, who is really great Davros. I, I really like his work here. Um, so we pick up at so, the. Oh, go ahead. So do you think? Um, do you think that Lucas and them used Davros as the Emperor? I mean, do you think that was a reference to the Emperor? It's possible. I certainly. I mean. Davros, that's what Davros, reminds Davros, me Davros was, was that. around, you know, in 1974. It's certainly possible. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I know that Lucas kind of lifted from uh, the John Pertwee era for uh, the Sand People. I have a, I have actually a okay. blog post about that on Damn Good Coffee, free okay. plug. But uh, yeah, um, there's a, there's this kind of like primitive tribe uh, during this one John Pertwee episode, which also happens to be a Dalek story. And uh, they're, I think it's Planet of the Daleks or something like that. But they're like, um, they're kind of like, uh, they're they're raising, they've got like spear-like weapons and they're like raising them over heads, whooping it up. And it's basically, it's, I mean, if you look at it, you would be like, oh my God, it's the Sand People from, yeah. from Star Wars. Okay. So, and you know, Lucas was an admitted sci-fi buff. He lifted from all kinds of sources. Sure. And it okay. was inspired by so many things. So I th- certainly think it's possible. I mean, it may not I may not have been a direct ripoff, but I think he might have been influenced. But I'm not seeing things when I see that connection, right? No, no, I don't think so. I okay. mean, yeah, it's it's Davros and the Emperor Palpatine is is certainly within the you know, they're kind of like peas of the same pod. Okay, you throw in Mr. Burns from the from the Simpsons as yes. well. Excellent. So, yes. Okay. So yeah, if there was the Simpsons version of Doctor Who, obviously Mr. Burns would be Davros. Okay. Obviously. Yes. And now then I want to see that episode. So wouldn't that be great? <laughs> I you know, I remember um in I fact I had write that episode. I have the um I certainly have the uh Matt Smith, you know, version of the Doctor in Simpson style is you know, one of my favorite right. um cartoons. But okay. So yeah, okay. Um going through the episode. Okay. Uh we pick up at the end of the cliffhanger uh from last week. Uh, after almost apparently being killed by the Daleks, you know, exterminated, uh, Missy and Clara suddenly are outside the Dalek city. Mm-hmm. Not quite sure how they got there. Uh, Missy explains how they managed to escape by using the energy emitted from the Daleks' weapons to use that as fuel to teleport themselves away. And so, Charles, this. Yeah. This reminds me mm-hmm. a lot of the um, the Douglas Adams style of storytelling, right? And I, you're smiling; no one else can see you. But um, because lucky you, you know, no. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that I in his um, Dirk. Uh, the holistic Dirk, agency, Dirk, Dirk, Dirk gently, Dirk holistic Gently's holistic detective agency. Yeah, yes. and there was a style that a comment would be made, and then it seems like you're on the other side of the country. Yeah, and then as you continue on, you realize that it's connected. Yeah. And I think that Missy story was very much that way, and and I thought it was clever, and I really loved. Clara, yeah, hanging upside down. <laughs> you know you're dizzy. I felt I felt bad for Jenna, Jenna, and that yes. because you know that all that blood rushing to your head. Yes, that couldn't have been comfortable. No, not at all. That couldn't have been okay. a comfortable shoot. Yes, but yeah. Um. So yeah, they uh, uh, the they the she used vortex manipulators. Um, they was get destroyed in the process of them teleporting. Uh. And then um, Missy talks about how the doctor performed the same trick in the little, we get a little flashback of the 12th doctor, although she doesn't make a specific reference to a specific doctor, but she said for kind of like the sake of argument, because, Hey, you know, it's cheaper this way. We'll just have the 12th doctor do it. Well, and I thought her point was they're all the doctor to me, to her. Yeah. You know, she doesn't see that. She doesn't. Yeah. The different incarnations. Yeah. And it's almost, you know, you could almost speculate that with time Lord vision, yeah. Time vision to you, you know, you see the core of the person and the outer shell is almost just like, you know, close. Right. The um, exactly. That's a good that's a good analogy. Uh, the doctor uh, 
doesn't believe that Claire is dead. Okay, so you you skipped off the important question okay. I have to ask you. All right, what's your question? So, do you join me in saying I want to hear the vampire monkey story? Yes, uh, yes, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, there was, there was, Misty makes a reference that the doctor fell down this pit or whatever after escaping yeah. and ended up in a pit of vampire monkeys. Yes. yes, I want to see the vampire monkey story. Hell, I want to write the vampire monkey story. Well, because I love that. And there was so much self-awareness right. of, you know, Clara's like, so he's okay. Of course not. He's the doctor. He yeah. fell into a mess of vampire monkeys. Yeah. Now, you <laughs> and, don't know for sure that she's kidding. But you do see the doctor with surrounded by what looks to be monkey eyes. So. Yes, it was. So it was maybe, just awesome. Yeah. Yes, but yeah, that's there's a story there, and w- even if it's just as little like one of these little um, short mini episodes, you know, that they do from time to time. Like, say for this would be a great charity story for uh, yeah. children in need. Absolutely. To tell the vampire monkey story. So hopefully, I'm sure Moffat's going to get all kinds of requests like, hey, what happened during the vampire monkey story? And yeah. eventually it'll drive him crazy. Er, yes. So, yeah. Um, so the doctor uh, forces Davros out of his life support wheelchair. Yeah. And for the first time, we kind of see what's beneath his waist. You know, like we do, and, you know, we get to... F- see him out of that chair this is the first time we've ever seen that so obviously yeah he doesn't have legs he doesn't have his other arm and it reminded me of the board queen yeah uh from uh you know uh, you could take your pick or you could take bishop from alien yes aliens where he gets cut in half and he's just yeah just a torso Mm -hmm. so yeah there's there's that okay Uh, um so he uses the um, uses the wheelchair to break into the same room where the Supreme Dalek is. Yes. And we find out that he's safe from the Daleks as they try to exterminate him because Davros, of course, built a force field inside his wheelchair. Yes. So because Davros doesn't trust the Daleks any more than the Doctor right. does, which is kind of funny. Well, you know, when but you... smart. Because they have backstabbed him before. Yeah, if you train a vicious attack animal, yes, you know you you have to worry that they may not may turn on you. you. Know, yeah, they may turn on you. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a that's another that's another great analogy. I love that yeah. analogy. Um, so he attempts to force the Daleks to find Clara for him and return her, but the Daleks thinks that she's dead. Mm-hmm. So we get. Colony Sarif, that lovely snake guy, yes, uh, appears in snake form from Davros's chair and forces the Doctor into unconsciousness. Yes, um, yeah, and and it it obviously was great seeing the Doctor in the chair. Yes, um, I and, also and, and I like his line where he talks about like you know look, we've all had this same nightmare. Yes, just face it, you've all worried about this. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah, very nice. Um, and you know, in a few minutes, we get a throwaway line: the the only other chair. In yeah. Scaro, you know, <laughs> and like why would there be another chair? Yep, would exactly. you think about it. You, did, you know. Well, maybe there would be a backup. Maybe the other yes. one runs. You know, like needs to get. The, you need to plug in the charger and yeah. <laughs> just like exactly. your cell phone. Yes, exactly. So yeah. Um, meanwhile, back in the city, uh, Missy and Clara go into a Dalek sewer. Where we find all kinds of like icky, decaying, and insane Dalek mutants, which can't die, and they're dumped in the sewer there once they're not useful anymore. We find mm-hmm. out. So this is all brand new territory for Doctor Who fans. Uh, Missy tricks Clara into setting off an alarm. And then handcuffs her to the wall as bait for an approaching Dalek. So obviously she's got a plan. Yeah, that's, that's not good for Clara. No, that's interesting. And, you know, we've already talked about it. There is a wonderful, and friendship is the wrong word, but Chem- there chem- is chemistry. Yeah, yes, there is a chemistry, a buddy cop movie. And, you know, uh, and he, Missy even addresses it. Of course, her partners, every minor needs a canary. Yes. <laughs> you know, which, is so. line, which is a great line because obviously she sees Clara as a means to her survival. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, Missy then uses a ring of dark star alloy to repeat, 
repeatedly puncture um, the casing of the Dalek that comes by uh, because I guess he, she wants to use the decaying Daleks that are around her to attack it in retaliation for being abandoned. I guess they're all all the mutants are kind of pissed off about being dumped in the sewer. Yes. So they're looking for a target, and hey, what better way to take care of this Dalek than to let the Dalek mutants do it? Right. Now, here's where it gets really interesting, because um, Missy, at this point, she says she got that ring of, uh, of Dark Star Alloy in the olden days on Gallifrey, and she says that the doctor gave it to her when her daughter dot, dot, dot. Yeah. And then she gets interrupted. Right. So we get Apparently, the important revelation that the Master has a daughter out there somewhere. Yes. So maybe we'll meet her at some point. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it be interesting if the Master's daughter was... Macy Williams. Macy Williams. Ooh, I had... uh, See, I just assumed this was the throwaway line. New fan theory. Boom. Yeah, because, you know, about the... I've known the Doctor since he was a little girl. Right. And, you know, the um, our niece podcast, Cuckoo for Who. Right. By the way, they gave us a shout out oh, uh, in their episode to their uncle podcast. Cheers, Cuckoo. Um, you know, they debated that was Missy picking at him. Like, oh, a, um, you know, oh, I've known him since he's a little girl, a whiny little girl. You know, not physically a girl, but, you know. Yeah. Um, so I just assumed that. But... That's a really interesting throwaway line, <laughs> yeah. and and it's in the like the first story of the season. Yeah, oh, maybe there's a payoff. I don't know. I honestly don't know if there's going to be a payoff. But wouldn't it be great if there was? Yes. Ooh. That, yeah. So yeah, thank you. TW for the win, Charles Skaggs. Yes. This is why you listen to Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor. Absolutely. Who All right. Um. After the uh, the Dalek gets destroyed or taken care of, Missy talks Clara into uh, getting inside the telepathically controlled Dalek casing, which mm-hmm. right away um, is a big mistake because you know this it's it's not good for Clara, as we know that Clara and Daleks don't really mix well together. Um, and she she you know like because. The whole Missy's whole plan here is to so that they can like trick their way back into the main city. So is this really kind of like Moffat's nod to Asylum of the Daleks, which he also wrote? So I was going to ask you. So Missy, I mean, um, Claire doesn't remember being Souffle Girl, right? No, no, because it's they were fragmented lives, right? So like the main Clara has never done that. Yes, but I did think of that. Right. Um, a lot. Now, I do kind of wonder if somehow Claire is connected, like psychically, right. to all these fragmented lives. And is that her version of um, yeah. Claire to, uh, you know, deja vu, Claire to views? Right. Where she, like, I feel like I've done this before. Right. Mm-hmm. But it's going to be really horrible if Moffat does some, like, timey wimey thing, and that's how he writes Clara out by having her turned into a Dalek at the end. Oh, that and and she becomes like that Oswin, you know, the persona, and that that yeah. the, that the eleventh Doctor finds. Yeah, that's gonna be yeah, that could be really. I could see Moffat doing that. Yes, so that, I agree. There's another possible thing for you to speculate on there. Okay, so interesting. Okay, yeah. Uh, so um, and oh, and and another nod. This is also kind of a nod to um, Ian Chesterton played by William Russell, doing the same thing in the second uh, Doctor Who story, the very first Dalek story called The Daleks. Right. Where where Ian climbs inside a Dalek to kind of impersonate it so that he can pretend to, like, have the others, the Doctor, Susan, and Barbara prisoner in order to get past them, Mm -hmm. get past these Daleks. So it's kind of a... Like, if you remember when we did uh, Doctor Who and the Daleks... Yes. That horrible, yes. Yes, I, I tried to yeah. wash my brain away, but okay. yeah. Well, the good version, good television version of that okay. story had Ian getting inside the Dalek. Now, it wasn't all Dick Van Dyke wacky comedy. Yes. This was, like, very serious, and they were trying to escape from the Daleks. So, yeah, so watch the Daleks. Forget about Doctor Who and the Daleks. Okay. So, if that makes sense. 
Uh, we find, let's see, Missy gives Clara instructions about how to work the Dalek. Uh, Clara tries to say her own name, but the Dalek programming inside only says the words, I am a Dalek. And should she try to do, have any kind of, of emotion, the system translates it as exterminate. Yes. And, and which ends up like activating weapons and all kinds of stuff. And yeah, it just, it, it essentially shows that maybe we, and this is kind of a revelation. We get that maybe the Daleks actually feel, but they can't show it because of the programming. Yeah. And, and all their frustration and all their anger fuels. I, that's how they get, yeah, that's yeah. how they reload. Right. And they would get mad because they can't express themselves as they want to because of the programming inside that casing. Yes. So that's a really interesting idea. It that, was. That Moffat came up with. Obviously, he's been thinking about this quite a bit. Uh, the doctor wakes up back in the infirmary, and Davros reveals that uh, the light, these life support cables surrounding it are connected to every Dalek on Scaro. Mm -hmm. And their life force is what's keeping Davros from kicking it. Yeah. So Davros tries to tempt the doctor. Muhahaha. Not out of shame, but out of compassion for his sickness. And so he basically tries to make him feel bad. Uh, the doctor, uh, the doctor ends up admitting that Gallifrey has returned, which I thought was a really bad move on the doctor's part. Why would you tell Davros that Gallifrey's back? But at this point, he figures, well, is Davros dying? But if he's playing Davros, yeah, they seem to be connecting. Unless he was and, using that as a way to kind of fool Davros. Yes, and you know, sometimes the best way to lie is to tell the truth as much as you can. Right. So, yes, and and I was buying mm -hmm. a lot of this. You've already talked about some of the best things was um, the Doctor and Davros, you know, connecting and talking. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, I don't want to make it an Aaron Sorkin show, uh, or a Kevin Smith movie, right? As right. Kevin Smith right. says, I, I, you know, on my movie would just be two guys talking. Yeah. But that was really a great part of this. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I totally agree. Um, like I said, the, those scenes with Capaldi and Julian Bleach were just gold. Yes. And I hope that we get to see Julian Bleach come back as Davros, at least with Capaldi in the during the Capaldi era once more, because I would love to see them together again. I think they're Absolutely. great. Um, they kind of had that same – to me, they had that kind of same chemistry that Tom Baker and Michael Fisher had in Genesis of the Daleks. So that's just okay. – an old school reference, but okay. Anyway, it's on uh, the DVR. I have yep. not. I, I've I've started watching it. It's a yep. little slow to begin with. To begin with, but it picks up. Yeah, and 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 I knew that's yeah common, and so I'm like, okay, it, I got to get in the. Mood. It's a six parter, so yeah, there's a little bit of a slow build. Yes, but uh, but okay. about episode three, things start really taking okay. off. Okay, good so, deal. Yeah, just hang in there. Yes. Um, Davros expresses his congratulations that the doctor managed to save Gallifrey, saying and, saying that every being should have a place to belong. And he seems to be really sincere. Now, Charles, Excellent. one of my Excellent. Yes. One right. of my character flaws is you're very trusting. And or strengths is I am very trusting yep. and I am a Samper, uh, I, I am a um, you're a push I, I, you're pushed oh, over. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I redemption stories are my kryptonite. Okay, you know, and and the I'm like, wow, talk about a great classic. <laughs> you know, to have this classic villain. Yeah, you know, dying. You know, and I knew there would be another one stepping up. Right, because it's too good of a villain. But yeah. you know, it. So did you sit there going, oh? <laughs> Um, I, I was touched by it, and there's a little uh, for, for Klimt, <laughs> to use a Mike Myers phrase from Saturday yeah. Night Live. You're a little for Klimt. Right. Yes, I was. I'm for yeah. for Klimt. <laughs> yes. Yep. Okay. Um, Davros opens his natural eyes. This is the mm -hmm. first time this has ever happened. Yeah. And you know, he talks about like he makes the comment like, "Let me look at you with my own eyes." And of course, immediately I'm thinking Return of the Jedi. Yes. When Darth or when Darth Vader says, "You know, take off my mask and let me look at you with my own eyes." So I'm wondering if Moffat kind of nicked that from Return of the Jedi. 
Mm -hmm. Getting back, well, it's kind of ironic because, you know, Lucas in Star Wars kind of lifted from Doctor Who. So, yeah, let, let's have Doctor Who lifting from Star Wars um, mm -hmm. and take it back. Uh, and he's looking for moral guidance from the Doctor, which I thought yes. was interesting. He's like, he's wondering if creating the Daleks was right. And I got to yeah. think the Doctor's like, no, nah, it's not the best idea you've come up with. And interesting, and this is where it gets really kind of weird if you're a comic book fan. The two start sharing a joke about the doctor's poor medical skills as Dav Davros's health continues to deteriorate. Yeah. And so, did you get like a Batman the Killing Joke kind of vibe from this scene as a comics fan? You know what I'm talking about? Alan Moore, Brian Ballen. Yes, I, I knew that. Classic. And, you know, I. I know that is where Batman um, and the Joker kind of share a joke. Right. And, and even um, though the Joker is just paralyzed Batgirl. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of really poor taste on Alan Moore's part, but okay. Yeah. And I, you know, they just talked about the, the killing joke in thought bubble podcast uh -huh. uh, with uh, Joanne Robinson, Joanna Robinson. And um, I'm drawing a blank um, on her co-host, but uh, Dave, David Gonzalez. And, okay. They they talked about that uh, that this was done years ago and that yes the because the whole story was using women as a story crutch to move the plot forward or right. to motivate the hero and that that's but uh, even Joanna you know from a female perspective said you know it's just a good story and and this isn't. Barbara Gordon story, it's Batman and Joker story, and actually it's Joker story. Um, I did not see that watching it live, but mm -hmm. now that you mentioned it, I see because, you know, they're laughing together. Yes. Closeness. And, and it's really and, creepy to hear Davros laughing at something. Yes, and this 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 bonding mm -hmm. and and I don't know the two of these guys sharing a laugh even after like they've had this mass genocidal war which has wiped out both of their people practically. The yeah, Daleks, and the Daleks and the Time Lords. And I would buy that. I mean, it didn't bother me, but I would buy it more um, the Doctor and the Master having that kind of moment because I've already said right. I think of them as Superman, Lex Luthor. Right. You know. So, um, but yes, I now that you mention it, I will never watch that episode again without thinking of that. <laughs> Charles, that added an extra layer. So you're welcome. You are, now you, you now you can curse my name every time. It's like you it's, may be exhausted, but you are on your A game tonight. I work I work best when I'm like running on uh, <laughs> running on empty. Running but, on empty. Yeah, running I, on. Okay. I knew you were gonna do that. Um, okay. The uh, Davros uh, declares that he wants to see da Scaro's son one last time. Yes. Sunrise. He wants to see the sunrise. Oh, isn't it sweet? He wants to see the sunrise. Yeah. Uh, the doctor rewires him to the life support system to try mm -hmm. to, you know, juice him up a little bit, give him a jump start. Uh, but he finds that not every Dalek in the city is enough to keep Davros alive for much longer. Yes. So, in apparently a move of self sacrifice here, the doctor releases a small amount of Time Lord regeneration energy. Okay, so I'm going to pause you there. Right. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I think I I'm know. I'm raising my hand in the class. Go ahead. And I'm saying, Jesse? hey, yeah. hey, Mr. Classic Who, yeah. uh, uh, you know, scholar. Yeah. Has this been something the doctor can do all the time to do? Now, I saw him repair Rivers. Right. Wrist with a little regeneration energy. Right. Is this a new twist from the doctor, or is this something they've been able to do in pieces uh, consistently? Well, they kind of they kind of implied it when back during the fifth Doctor story, um, Modron Undead with mm -hmm. Peter with Peter Davison's Doctor. Um, there's these uh, these creatures that um, they're basically through the result of experiments to try to m turn themselves into time lords they end up becoming kind of like these undead kind of creatures where um you know if they like they they instantly regenerate into the same body and they can't die okay so, so um they they're kind of like in this kind of essentially an undead state where um they don't feel really alive but yet they can't die and the doctor ends up getting hooked up to this machine. Okay. And th 
through a series of events because he kind of gets forced into it because Modern and his people kind of threaten the Doctor's companions, Nyssa and Tegan. And so if he doesn't do this, then... Um, you know, they're going to let Nissan Tegan die. So the doctor steps in the machine with the uh, intention of like using his regenerations, remaining regenerations to heal Modron and his people in exchange for keeping Nissan Tegan safe. And because okay. this is the fifth doctor, he's very heroic. He's very self-sacrificing. So yeah, that's what okay. he does. Okay. So, uh, all right. So good. it's kind of, so I would say, yeah, it's, it's kind of, you know, been there. This is this is not nothing really uh, new. Not a big hand wave. No, no, they didn't show him actually releasing any regeneration energy. But, okay, but but he was willing to do it. Let's put it that way. Okay, good. Um, okay, so um, so uh, the regeneration energy here goes into the cables to restore some of Davros's health. He's not as saggy in the face. Uh, it's basically like he gets a little nip tuck. Yeah, a little plastic surgery. Uh, in doing so, however, the Doctor falls victim to Davros's real plan. It's a trap! Dun, dun, dun. It's it a is trap. a trap. It's a trap. And Davros shakes fist. Uh, the regeneration en- energy gets transmitted through the life support system into every Dalek on Skaro. This increases their power, and be- they begin creating hybrid creatures. Mm-hmm. And thankfully, not hybrid creatures like we saw in Evolution of the Daleks. Where you had that one Dalek mute, like hybrid that kind of looked like he had phalluses on his head, mm-hmm. which was really in the you know, where he's wearing the the gangster suit and with the phalluses on his head. Yeah. So yeah, that's thankfully we skipped that one. Um, apparently, we find out that this was kind of mentioned in Gallifreyan mythology, and Davros for some reason thinks this is the real reason the Doctor originally ran from Gallifrey. And you know, I I'm, not, that was I'm a, not sure. It's interesting, but I'm not sure I buy it. I don't either. And I think, I think there could be a reason why the doctor has been running. Yeah. But I don't know if I think that makes for a great discussion and mm-hmm. a good story point. But I don't know necessarily if this is it. Right. You know. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll see. But yeah, I, I just thought it was a little too convenient yes. to just throw something that important as at a casual side. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so I think it's just more that Moffat's trying to get fans speculating. That's absolutely. Way, that's the way I see it. Well, and I also see this as a little bit as, you know, Davros is just jacking with him. Yeah, that's what I kind you know, of thought, too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, so that's okay, right? Right. He's just messing with him, totally. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so after breaking back in the city and abandoning Clara. Yes. Uh, thanks, Missy. Uh, Missy appears and saves the doctor from the life support system, killing Col- killing evil snake guy, Colony Sarf, in the process. And there was much yes. rejoicing because there that, was. Guy, that guy's icky. Uh, the doctor then reveals to Davros that, hey, guess what? I knew you were going to backstab me all along, and I just let you do this because right. I'm messing with you now. Yeah, and, and Dav- Davros hadn't realized the, uh, what you know the kind of danger he was creating here. So, yeah, and I I I have a little bit of problem with that. Mm-hmm. You know the whole how did the doctor figure it out? Yeah, and also <sighs> because he doesn't trust Davros. I mean, yeah. he, you know, even though Davros might be trying to sell him, like, he's like, you're not dying. That's the way he starts off the episodes. Like, you're not dying. Yeah. Okay. And then, you know, he starts trying to open his heart to him. And I'm sure it's like the doctor's thinking, what are you doing? Like, he's thinking this in his yeah. head. Like, why are you like crying on me here? Okay. You know, so I don't care if you're dying. You would be trying to kill me yes. if you were really dying. Yeah. So anyway, that's the way I took it. Okay, fair enough. Uh, in reaching every Dalek on the planet, the regeneration energy simultaneously revives all the decaying Daleks in the sewers as part of the Doctor's plan. Okay. He's see, like, one word more on, second word, sewers. So should the Doctor know that there's a sewer full of... Um, Daleks? Daleks. Maybe. Maybe that was something he picked up during, learned during the Time War. 
Okay. Um, just he, I mean, he is two thousand years old. He probably knows some stuff we don't. We haven't. We don't know that okay. he knows. Okay. Fair enough. I mean, it, yeah, it wasn't explained in the episode. Okay. And it would have been nice if it would have been explained earlier in the episode to have yes. so that we could figure it out along with the doctor, mm -hmm. as opposed to just the doctor magically knows. But yes. Okay. So yeah, this this is where you kind of get into the the realm of like, well, maybe this episode wasn't entirely perfect. Yeah, and when you start looking, you go, okay. You, when you, you start, start picking nits, up. picking nits. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good deal. Yeah. Um. So the the dogs from the sewers break through the surface. They start attacking the the. The Daleks that are actually there, and you know, and they're like the the new new look Daleks, the classic looking Daleks, the the even the special weapons Dalek. They start attacking them in revenge, and then the Doctor and Missy run into Clara, mm -hmm. who just happens to still be inside that Dalek casing. Yes, and Missy being Missy, totally being Missy here, she lies yes. flat out to the Doctor. She's like, oh, Clara was murdered, and that's the Dalek that did it. Yes. Now, I I embrace yeah. Missy's evilness. Right. Uh, you know, if and she had and, a mustache, she would be twirling it. Yes, and and partly because you get the payoff mm -hmm. of when Clara's revealed. Yeah. You know, the fake. Uh, wow! What, what, how in the world can that be? <laughs> yeah, wow! I, I didn't know it, that. I didn't see that coming. Yeah, you know, and it it reminded me. Uh, spoilers on Big Bang Theory, but um, the episode as we're recording this was last night, mm -hmm. and um, you know Howard's wife Bernadette was has known this secret for a while, and she was talking to Penny like. I, I haven't had time to process it because I just <laughs> learned this moment, even though, you know, <laughs> yeah, she's he's known. been knowing it. And yeah. it's, that's kind of missy. Like, I, I'm so shocked that this is happening. It was very <laughs> funny. Um, let's see here. Uh, where was it? Uh, Claire attempts to tell the doctor who she is. But of course, the speed, the programming doesn't let her, and just, she just keeps saying the words "I am a Dalek, I am a Dalek" over and over. Yeah, we have, and, the, and the doctor kind of stares at the Dalek and is like, "Hmm." Um, yeah, the um, y you know, you have Chekhov's gun, you have Chekhov's Dalek speech. Yeah, you know, we've established that you, that's all you can do. So there we go. So yes. Yeah, but it's when um, Clara starts pleading for mercy. Yes. That's when the doctor goes, wait a second here. Mm -hmm. And the doctor realizes that, oh, okay, there's somebody in there, isn't there? Yeah. So he has the Dalek open its casing, and guess what? It's Clara, of course. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, because, like, the Dalek's having the concept of mercy. I mean, the only yeah. Dalek that um, ever expressed mercy was the one that said mercy to River Song. Right. But the doctor wasn't there. Right. So he's never heard that. Absolutely. But uh, and this is what and this was a kind of a cool moment. It's very subtle. But uh, Capaldi just glares at Missy at that point and tells her to run. Yes. Like, you better get away from me. Like, as opposed to just telling his companions to run mm -hmm. for, for their lives. He's telling Missy to run for her yes. for her own life from right. him. Because otherwise, I think he's going to kill her for doing this to Clara. Absolutely. So that was kind of I, I just love I kind of love that that just that yes that seething. And he tells her again, right? Yeah. Run, run. So I, I love that as well. Yeah. So she does that. She ends up getting uh, confronted by a bunch of Daleks, and then you think, okay, well, she's captured by the Daleks. But then she says, "Well, I've just had a very clever idea," mm -hmm. which of course is just. A quick way to say, well, the master gets out of it somehow. Yes. Even though we don't yeah. know how. Yes. We'll see the master again. Yes. Um, so wrapping all this up, uh, the doctor summons the TARDIS, uh, which we find out that he used uh, the hostile action displacement system, the HADS, which we last saw in the episode Cold War. Okay. You remember when it uh, ends up in South Pole by mistake? Yes. And okay. they're, in the, they're in the North Pole or something like that or reverse. But yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. So probably, I think the TARDIS is the North Pole. They were at the South Pole, something like that. Okay. But yeah, so it's that's that's a reference to that. Um, Good. The had so that's established, and then he summons the TARDIS back by using his spiffy new sonic sunglasses or sonic yes. shades, if you will. Yes, and so that's kind of a nice. Um, I'm not sure if I love that all the time, but I think it was a funny. Yeah. You know, kind of way to go wink, wink. Yeah. Uh, you I know, hope, I, I hope this isn't the new status quo because I don't want to see Sonic Shades from here on. No. You want to but see Sonic Screwdriver. But it does, it, it almost is a wink to cosplayers everywhere. Yeah, it's, it's like, you know, you better start buying Ray Ban sunglasses. Yeah, go buy your Ray Ban so that you can be, you know, Capaldi. Yeah. Yep. Yes. And I have already, a. I already have my pair because I had them from back in the day. Ha. Uh, very nice. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. I'm already ready. Yes. Um, the doctor and Clara watch from afar as the city gets destroyed. Yes. And the doctor once again, wonders once again, why the Dalek asked for mercy, something it shouldn't have understood. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden that makes him realize he has something still to do. Yes. So here's, we kind of get the resolution to last week's cliffhanger. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, he gets in the TARDIS, he goes back to the young Davros stranded in the battlefield and we finally get the full timey-wimey explanation of that moment where yeah. Doctor raises up the, the Dalek weapon. And at, during the cliffhanger, of course, we thought he was going to kill the kid. Right. So that Davros is not existing or does not exist. Uh, but instead, he shoots the hand mines that surrounded Daleks or yes. surrounded Davros. So which we kind of like we're hoping for anyway. Right. Because, hey, it's the Doctor. He's supposed to save the kids even, even if they grew up to be hitler slash davros absolutely so yeah so the doctor is the hero that we all know he should be yes and then uh davros the child davros mm -hmm. ask, ask him which side he's fighting for in the war uh the doctor takes him away from the battlefield saying it doesn't matter what side he's on as long as there's mercy Right. So, so he's emphasizing that mercy part to get it kind of in Davros's head so that it will get into the programming of the Daleks. Yes, that was. Um, and that's where we end the episode. Yes. Um, yeah. A uh, couple highlights for you mm -hmm. that you want to share. Anything specifically highlight? Um, well, we had Davros's question to the doctor where he asked, am I a good man? Yes, and well, that was the, been that was that was a nod back to the same one the doctor asked himself, right. to Clara, in Into the Dalek. Right. So it's kind of like a parallel, showing the parallels between the Doctor and Davros. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've already talked about mine. I love the Doctor in the chair. Yeah. Clara and the Dalek and the Sonic Shades. I don't want them all the time, but they were kind of cool. Yes. Yeah. And then Missy, I like the bit where Missy tells the Dalek to inform the Supreme Dalek that the bitch is back. Yes. And which, of and, course, is a nod to the Elton John song, The Bitch is Back. And I did like the, uh, I do think Missy, if you had to go a episode MVP, it's right. Missy. Because she's like, you are an enemy of the Daleks. Okay, yeah. if you're not a Dalek, you're an enemy. So that's an easy one, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so while we're yeah. on the subject, what was your favorite lines of the episode? Because there, um, was, there were so many. <laughs> it was. Um, yeah. So I, I have, I have two. Okay. Um, I have the very beginning with Missy. Yeah. Because this is so um, Princess Bride. Uh -huh. You know, like, what are our obstacles and what are our advantages? You know, <laughs> you didn't tell me we had a wheelbarrow. <laughs> um, so Missy Gang, he's trapped at the heart of the Dalek Empire. Mm -hmm. He's a prisoner of the creature who hates him the most in the universe. Between us and him is everything the deadliest race in all of history can throw at us. We, on the other hand, have a pointy stick. Yes. How do we start? And Claire gives the, we assume we're going to win. And then she wants I, a pointy stick. <laughs> and yes, yes, really. Um, I, that was, I, I love that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I'm going to save one. I think you're going to pick. Well, you, you already took one that I picked. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That was the, the he's trapped at the heart of the Dalek empire. That was one. Yeah. I so, um, so and I got, then, I have three. Okay, go ahead. Do one. Okay. Go one. Then I'll do I'll, one. I'll go my second one. 
Um, okay. So uh, the doctor, he's saying, you know, like, have you seen the sa- state of this place? I mean, this is exactly where you dump a smelly old uncle's slash family pet slash genius scientist who couldn't even invent legs. Yes. Seriously, how do your boys take it when everybody else has got two eyes? Yes. And um, my other one, which I thought you were going to take is, of course, the real question is, where did he get a cup of tea? Yeah. That was... Answer, I'm the doctor. Just accept it. it. Yeah, I was going to take that one. <laughs> yes. But I did have a, one more. Okay. Um, this was the exchange between Davros and the, the doctor. Where Mm -hmm. Davros says, it is so good of you to help me. And the doctor says, replies, I'm not helping you. I'm helping a little boy I abandoned on a battlefield. I think I owe him a sunrise. Yes. Which I thought was a magical line. That was very magical. And from the soft-hearted Jesse, of course I love that line. (laughs) Uh, So, um, rating? Uh, I give this one... Uh, nine out of ten rings of dark star alloy, and I give it nine out of ten pointy sticks. Nice, which is very Buffy of yes. the do- of the yeah. Missy. Yes. Right. Uh, so before we go to reverse reverse the polarity, I, yeah. I saw this on Twitter, mm-hmm. and I love this. Uh, Toby Whithouse mm-hmm. tweeted. While you're all being very lovely about my upcoming Who episodes, which obviously doesn't make me nervous, all caps, at all. <laughs> no, sir. Not one bit. <laughs> yeah, because, uh, cause, yeah, we, we, get, uh, we go under the lake next mm-hmm. week, which, is, of course, is part one of, written by to- Toby Whitehouse. Whitehouse. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So that'll be next week. All right, so do you uh, do you have a reverse the polarity for us? Yeah, um, last week we did Genesis of the Daleks because obviously, right? So I can't. I'm not. I'm not going to pick that one again. Although it kind of applies here as well. Yes, it does. Um, so I'm going to go with Destiny of the Daleks. Ooh, okay. Which, which is another Tom Baker episode. It was the second appearance of Dav- Davros after Genesis okay. of the Daleks. Uh, this is the first story. Um, from season 17 in 1979, uh, written by Terry Nation, the creator of the Daleks, yes. uh, which was also his last and ended up being extensively rewritten by Douglas Adams. Okay. But uh, Terry Nation gets full credit on this, even though okay. apparently Douglas rewrote it. And it was directed by Ken Grieve. And what this is, this is the first appearance of Lala Ward as the second Romana. Ooh. So I thought that might pique your interest. Yes, indeed. After City of Death. Yes. And uh, so we've got, uh, after the events of the Key to Time season in season 16, the Doctor and Romana are randomly traveling through the universe using this device called a randomizer because they are trying to hide from this uh, villain called the Black Guardian. And so the way they're getting around traveling is just like, well, we don't know where we're going to end up, so therefore he can't find us. Okay. So the TARDIS ends up on this rocky planet with dangerous levels of radioactivity, which, of course, turns out to be Scaro. Yes. And there's this group of aliens called the Mavellans, who kind of look like uh, an outer spacey Buck Rogers version of Bo Derek and Ten with All like right. beaded hair. Um, so kind of keep that in mind. It's the 70s, late 70s. Okay. Um, very glam rock. Let's just put it that way. Okay. Um, these Mavellans are waging war on the Daleks. And the Daleks, meanwhile, are looking for Davros, who was put in suspended animation after the events in Genesis of the Daleks. The Daleks want Davros as an advantage against the Mavellans because the Daleks and the Mavellans, it turns out, uh, have been having like two centuries of stalemate from both sides battle computer. So it's mm-hmm. kind of like that Star Trek episode, let that be your last battlefield or whatever, right. that, where you have like the two cities that have right. computers fighting each other. Yes. And they can't win because both computers keep figuring out how to, you know, plan right. plan anticipate their attacks. So they so the Daleks plan is to get Davros so that they can kind of overcome that. The Doctor in this episode, and da- or in this story, the Doctor and Davros have a nice little talk, as they mm-hmm. do in this episode, which is kind of made, what made me think of it. Yes. Um, they start talking about the Daleks' accomplishments, in air quotes, mm-hmm. during the thousands of years he's been in suspended animation. 
So they kind of have this little like little heart to heart, even though Davros is talking about all this these evil beings that he's created. So okay. it kind of re- it kind of reminded me of this a little bit. So very nice. All awesome. right, we will check it out. So definitely check it out, and it's a great it's a good episode. So good. Hope you dig it. Uh, yes, I will check it out. Anything else we need to cover, sir? I think that about does it. Okay. That's all I. That's all I have. I hope you get some rest. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> and uh, we'll have to figure out when we're going to record next week because Cowboys have a night game okay. on Sunday. So we'll have to figure out how mm-hmm. we're going to do this. But um, maybe, uh, maybe another Monday. I don't know. Yeah. All right. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Uh, Charles, how can they find you? Um, I am at Charles Skaggs on the Twitter machine and at Charles Skaggs on Instagram. And then Google Plus for all you crazy kids on the Google Plus. And I'm on Facebook, of course. And my blog of geeky things, Damn Good Coffee and Hot, where I talk about things like Doctor Who and Next Stop Everywhere. Yes. And, uh, of course, my par- the other podcast I do with our f- lovely friend Karen Lindsay called The Fandom Zone Podcast. Yes. So, And you guys are about to get busy. Yes, we are, because we've got Angels of S.H.I.E.L.D. starting up tonight in yes. just 20 minutes from now. So, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and I am at Jesse Jackson DFW on Twitter mm-hmm. um, and Jesse Jackson on Facebook. Uh, please go to iTunes, Next Stop Everywhere, and give us a rating or a review. Uh, it really does help us. Yeah, um, please do. We haven't, had one for, we haven't had one for yeah. a while, so yeah, that would be great. And it would be a big help. And... I am in the middle of getting my new podcast, Set Lusting Bruce, off. We're up to, we just released our sixth episode today with the Philly Elvis. Um, and so if you are ha- are passionate about music and have a favorite um, artist that doesn't have to be Bruce Springsteen, mm-hmm. please reach out to me and let me know that you'd be interested to be on the show, and I'd love to have you on there. I may uh, take you up on that. Yes, I am hoping you do. I would love for us to talk about either the police or Sting mm-hmm. yeah. or you know some of the – I think that would be fun. I think that would be fun too. Um, in fact, tomorrow night, Wendy Hembrook, oh. who was on this, is talking Pearl Jam with me. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Well, so tell, that's gonna, tell Wendy I said hi. I will do that. And so uh, – but for now – We are going to say keep hope alive Mm -hmm. and say sealed inside your casing, not feeling anything ever from birth to death, locked inside a cold metal cage, completely alone. That explains your voice. No wonder you scream. Nice. Thanks, guys. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye, everyone.